and welcome to Musicals with Cheese. And today we've got a bonus interview episode with the amazing Raquel Sion. Is that correctly pronounced? <laughs> That is correctly pronounced, Jesse. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. It really is an honor to meet you. Why? Same. <laughs> I'm very excited. Oh, not not as excited as I am, because I've just been basically drowning myself in all of her incredible works. Um, because on July 19th, there will be a 50th birthday show. Um, and NARAL, N-A-R-A-L, pro-life, pro life pro Pro-choice fundraiser, not pro-life. That's well, very, yeah, very different. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think pro-choice is pro-life, but that, oh, we can, uh, we yeah. can go down that rabbit hole soon enough. <laughs> uh, no, um, but that's coming up. It'll be um, on the Pangea 178 Second Avenue in New York City at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. The doors open and the show begins at 8 p.m. And she will be performing many, many things, including a good amount of David Bowie, which you oh, do not want to miss. Um, so we're just going to get talking and talking about everything and anything and everything. Fabulous. <laughs> so Let's first, do it. First things first, how would you describe yourself, your art and your artistic goals to those who may not have heard of you before? Just give us an introduction to Raquel Sion. Um, well. Here we go, since I'll, I'll connect this to your podcast. When I was a kid, I wanted to be in musical theater. I desperately, desperately wanted to be Annie or any of the orphans. Um, that didn't happen. <laughs> so, but I did a lot of musicals when I was uh, in elementary, junior high and high school. Um, that said, I never quite <laughs> fit into musical theater. Um, you know, I was a character actor at like 10. You know, I always cast as the mom or the whore. Um, oh. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't a whore at 10, but um, <laughs> things, <laughs> things develop. Uh, not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too rapidly but um uh so when i went to school for theater i went to uh nyu in the mid 80s Ooh. oh because it's my 50th birthday what um, no one would believe that no way <laughs> who, who'd have thunk it <laughs> it's so strange um so we'll put on a show and distract myself with that instead of the number. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I got to New York, I was put into the experimental theater wing at New York University. And I was like, oh, my people, here we go. And I've done kind of off, off Broadway work ever since. I've done a lot of dance theater. I've done. Um, a lot of directing of solo work with kind of multimedia productions with two women who are fabulous, uh, Kim Katzberg and Nora Woolley. We have a company called Eat a Radish Productions. Um, and then, as you know, doing theater uh, doesn't quite pay often no, 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 no. um so i i had a friend my friend Catherine valentine was doing uh was one of the forerunners of the neo burlesque movement and she was putting a show together and we were roommates at the time and she asked me to sing in it and i was like but i don't sing in front of people you know i hadn't done that really since high school in my moments of musical theater. And so I started singing in these shows, in this show called The Baba Voo Room. And then I just started getting more gigs singing. And then I started writing solo shows, which are, in my mind, plays disguised as cabarets. Because I don't really know, cabaret can have a very strict form. And I don't really know that form, so I just do whatever I want to. <laughs> so, um, and for the past four years, I've been doing a Bowie show um, because 
I'm a ridiculously huge Bowie fan. And um, it took me a long time to kind of, even though everyone knows that about me, everyone who knows me knows that about me. It was almost a showing the depth of it was a little scary because it's <laughs> it's it runs really deep. It's like um, taking on Shakespeare in a way. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's that. There's like not wanting to dishonor him in any way because of my respect for him and his work is beyond beyond. Um, and yeah, also just my, my own, anyone who has um, something that they are extremely dedicated to or love a lot oftentimes doesn't have um, reason with certain things. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of came out with the, the things that I uh, don't have that I'm not reasonable uh, when it comes to him. And, um, and it, <laughs> and I guess people connect with it. So um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm turning 50. It's a little freaky. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Bowie for his 50th did a huge show, sold out show at MSG uh, at Madison Square Garden for charity for Save the Children. And he had guest singers and musicians. Uh, so I said, why not just do that and get myself some joy by basking in the Bowie? So that's my gig. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds incredible like honestly it sounds like a night to remember like not even just as a performer but as an audience member i feel like i'd just be like my body on the back of the walls by the end of it just enraptured in the voice because i'm not sure if anyone out there has heard videos of her but her bowie like her taking on bowie is such an incredible interpretation i have a lot of questions about how you go about taking on such ubiquitous mm. music um what is your process for interpreting a cover and do you find it hard to write the line between your own interpretation and the original song like how do you go about that um it takes a lot of well i i approach singing as an actor more than as a singer i think so for me it's it's really about the story and what connects me to the song um, and it's, it's difficult with certain, well, it's difficult with these songs too, because they are, I mean, I listen to Bowie every day, mm -hmm. <laughs> every day <laughs> and have for the past 35, 37 38 years, <laughs> uh, maybe more. So um, the songs are so in me. Um, and it's, it's actually creating, um, creating a distance in a way to approach them again. And what's really great is, well, first of all, my band is astounding. My musical director, Carl St. Lucie, is a genius. He's incredible. He put, he's written these four part harmonies for practically every song um, in the set. We're doing 18 songs. And, um, and he also is a counter tenor. So he will be singing, we'll be doing a duet. I'll be doing the baritone and he'll be doing the counter tenor for the man who sold the world. Um, what's great about my band is that they are not Bowie people in the way that I am Bo a Bowie person. So the music, they can approach the music in a really fresh way, in a really new way. 
And uh, that really helps me see it differently and hear it differently. Um, because I'm not, I mean, I'm obviously, well, I'm not a man and I'm not British and um, no one is near as pretty as he was. And yeah, so I have to, I have no choice but to do it as myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great way to interpret it. Like the phrase that you said specifically is I go into it as a like acting. And I think that I would appreciate that a lot more and like more contemporary major stars to go into every song that they're taking on as a, an act of storytelling. I fully agree. I fully agree. Well, a lot of songs, I mean, I think that's also the test of a song whether it can hold up to that story. And I don't mean story and it doesn't have to be, a, and Bowie is very much not uh, this. It doesn't have to be a traditional narrative, but the intention, the arc of the song or the, the map of the song has to come through. Um, and that's one thing I love about Bowie is that he, the intention, the emotional intention is so clear to me. Oftentimes he, you don't know what he's talking about and, and that's okay because there's, the, again, there's room for you to interpret it and put yourself in it. I think that's why so many people are so dedicated to him and his music. And he's carried so many people through some really dark times and really joyful times, too. I feel like this is, I really want this party to be a celebration, you know, of his work and of the community and this wonderful space that has been a home to the show, to uh, my show, me and Mr. Jones. Now I've got a question as to basically writing a cabaret. Like I've always mm. been curious what an artist must do to prepare for a cabaret performance. It's like preparing a piece of musical theater with a tact of a stand-up comedy set and the timing. And how do you go about writing for a cabaret performance? Um, I think it starts well, one uh, it depends i've i've done shows that have been character driven so that's um i have a the, a french character that i do named cuckoo bijou who um so it's kind of her she's somewhat based on uh kiberia the knights of kiberia the Fleeny film so you know she's she is a whore. <laughs> she is a whore. <laughs> you know, with a golden heart who always wants to fall in love and always gets disappointed. So it's just that very traditional story. So I feel like um, her, you know, that kind of classic almost comedia line is, is uh, what I follow in terms of a narrative with her. And then it's plugging in the correct music and um the stories that either reinforce the narrative or contradict the narrative um i did another show called gilding the lonely which i did at joe's pub a few years back and that was looking at loneliness from different aspects kind of looking at the facet of a gem so um sometimes the songs and the monologues would drive you further into loneliness. Sometimes it's what gets you out. Um, what you indulge in, um, what you fantasize of, of that happily ever after illusion. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's an illusion. And no um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, contentment would be good, but Happily ever after, please. Um, <laughs> so, and with the with the Bowie show with me and Mr. Jones, my 
intimate relationship with David Bowie, um, it was kind of how he, where he fit into my life, you know, how the parallels either with his career or with um, his personal struggles and my personal struggles and how they're how he was kind of always there for me. And, and then of course you want to sing your favorite songs. Although some do hit the cutting room floor and that, that hurts, but it has to happen. Mm-hmm. Did that hey. make any sense? No, that made perfect sense. You answered oh. it very well. <laughs> But much like stand-up comedy, I'm always curious, like, have you ever been heckled at a cabaret concert? And if so, how do you usually handle that? I have. I'm I'm really good with that. I'm I actually um I mean I don't want to be heckled, but um I um that's kind of the fun stuff in live performance, you know? Um, it wakes everyone up, myself included, (laughs) you know, it keeps it, it keeps it, uh, there. Maybe it's also because I, you know, I've worked with children a lot. I know how to shut things down. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I think it is that, I mean, yeah, it's like with any, Mm -hmm. I don't go full Patty Lapone. <laughs> Who do you think you are? I mean, I've had those moments, but uh, no, <laughs> she. I mean, I, uh, she deserves and and merits that behavior. Um, yeah, I think it's it's just being in the moment and and figuring out what to engage and what not to engage. Um, I think the last time I had some strange heckling, there was someone in the audience who was actually, well, he was trashed, but he was also just like kind of overly enthusiastic to the point where no one could actually listen to the story that was being told. Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah. I just at one point yeah. just said, "Hey, honey, I'm. Let me tell my story now, okay?" And then he just shut up. <laughs> you know, it's like maybe he just wanted to be acknowledged. I mean, who knows? Um, yeah, I kind of embraced those mistakes, though. Or, I mean, my mistakes too. Was, that's the fun stuff. The awkwardness of just casual life. I love it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, in life, it's much more daunting. On stage, it, it's, uh, there are very, there are clear parameters. So it's easier to lean into those. Mm-hmm. For me, at least. Life is a whole other thing. Now I've got a question for you about um, in the past you've been described of half witch, half cabaret performer. Do you think that that description is accurate and why? Well, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to work that New York times quote until they give me a better one. Um, (laughs) No, I think it's a great, I, I love it. Um, That. I like it in terms of the kind of conjuring because what ultimately I like to try to achieve and also when I go see things, I want a certain kind of, I want to be transported. Um, And there are many ways to do that. And I do think theater, cabaret, song, music, art uh, is a conjuring, is a a creating 
of a an alternate reality. So yeah, I dig that. I think it's a great quote. Um, although I don't find anything all that witchy about you, there is something magical when I see you on stage. You do kind of tend oh. to control like everything up there in a magic way. I can be witchy. <laughs> <laughs> I can. You want? I'll give you some ex boyfriends. Uh, they can. They can do testimonials. Um, yeah, I. I can be a little witchy. I had a Wiccan moment. I had a very strong Wiccan moment in college, reading Starhawk and lighting candles and casting spells. Um, maybe some of that stuck. <laughs> I think we uh, all had our wicked moments, I'm going to say. Of course, and some still do, which is, like, right on. Yes. Fantastic. Do your thing. <laughs> oh, um, me, oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a question for you about David Bowie, like just in general, oh, like your personal okay. relationship. What David Bowie song do you think you connect the most with and why? Um, oh, it's an emergency in my neighborhood. Um, is it New York? Life on, Mars, so, it's... Life on Mars is still my favorite. <laughs> it's my favorite. I just, again, it's that thing of being transported. Ever. Every time I hear it, it just opens up for me. And I think I very much connect with that yearning, that wanting, that feeling outside of what's going on around you. Um, if you ask, probably, I would say 98% of Bowie fans would say that they felt like an outsider and that he gave them a place to exist or a possibility um, other than what was before them or me as it were. Um, yeah. Life on Mars. It just, every time it just works for me every time. And I, and I do that song in my Me and Mr. Jones show, and I'm horrified of it every time. <laughs> every time. It scares me. <laughs> now, why does it scare um, you so much, do you think? It's a big song. Mm. It's, a, it's another one of those where, like, tell the story, although the story is a little odd. Um, you know, there are lyrics like, Mickey Mouse has grown up a cow, you know, what do, I'm not sure. Sometimes I know what that means. Sometimes I completely don't. Sometimes I have another interpretation altogether. Um, and that, that Mar, that the note on Mars is daunting, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, but it is it's a it's a it's a wonderful song to sing it's just it's my it's both my comfort and it rides a little bit discomfort uh a place of discomfort in that um you know the bar is high the bar is high for it I mean, I completely understand that as well. Um, I do have another question about um, David Bowie and all that. Like, I can I, talk about Bowie all the time. I know. I, 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 I 100% believe it. Um, what do you think sets him apart from the contemporaries in the genre, and why do you think you gravitated to him as opposed to like many of the other folk at that time? Mm. That's actually kind of what my show is about. Um Ooh. I mean, not the, not the birthday show. The birthday show, we're just doing his set, most of his set, because um, he did 25 songs. So they aren't going to let us stay that long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it took a long time for me to whittle it down. Um, um, 
as I said, I did the show Gilding the Lonely and and I was in terms of conjuring, I'm gonna connect all this stuff. Okay, get ready. Okay. Um, ready. <laughs> in terms of like the conjuring, I was like, oh, maybe I need to focus on another emotion. I'm gonna do uh the show about another emotion, another state of being, and what what do I want in my life? Like what do I want to bring to me? Like maybe I'm bringing myself more loneliness if I keep doing this show. Um, my former drummer called me the lady of our lady of lonely. Um, <laughs> which was like, oh. It's kind of lovely, but also ouch. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I was like, Oh, I'll do a show about love. Hmm. What do I love? Who do I love? And it was just, Bowie. I love Bowie. <laughs> and for a long time, people had said, you should do your Bowie show. And I'm like, no, I can't do a Bowie show. Um, so the, the why of it is still so elusive to me. And, and oftentimes with love, it's elusive. You know, I love this person. I'm connected to this person. It doesn't make sense, but I am. Um, Bowie does make sense in many ways. I mean, he's, he was experimenting. He was androgynous. He was gender bending and fierce and emotional. And his voice just moves me. Um, I do get sick of pretty much everything and everyone, myself included. <laughs> and I never get sick of Bowie. Just never. I'm always fascinated. There's actually a wonderful uh, biography called Strange Fasc Fascination, a Bowie biography. Um, yeah, I'm just always interested. And he as a musician, as a person, as an artist, because he, he also acted, he also painted, he designed clothes, he designed stage sets, he, you know, he edited art forum. I mean, he, he did so many things. Um, he was consummately curious. And that to me, means that you're engaged and you're alive and you're in the world. And he was so in the world that he changed the world. All right. That, that was a fantastic response and I loved it. <laughs> now, let's talk about I you. This you is your... deep. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Uh, let's talk about you and the fact that it's your 50th birthday. Like I, like, tell me about what you want people to go in wanting and what do you want them to leave thinking after this big concert? Um, I want us, as, as he said in his, uh, in his concert after the first song, he says, uh, we're your rock band for the night. We're going to get partyfied. Like, just, I just want to have a party. And, and rock out, kick out the jams. Um, I want there to be joy. We have, it's going to be so much fun. Life has been hard <laughs> for, uh, I mean, for this country, it's been hard. Um, I, I've, I'm on the other side of breast cancer. I had, I got diagnosed with breast cancer and, uh, September of 2016. I've been through it. I want to have some joy. So I'm sorry, that was, I know it's intense to drop the C word, but it's real. And, um, you know, I have arthritis in my toes from treatment, but uh, besides that, I'm pretty much, you know, I'm no evidence of disease. So I want to, 
I just want to have a party. I want to, I want to celebrate that I'm at this place instead of, you know, the being daunted by it, though it is a little daunting. Um, so the gig is we have, and Pangea is the best and they are so generous and kind to us. They're like family. They've given us the whole place for the night. So since it is a small East Village cabaret space and in the back of a restaurant, they're giving us the whole place. And we are just going over the top. We have nine guests coming to sing with us and play sax and play harmonica. Uh, the band is two guitars, bass, drums, keyboard, piano, uh, backup singer. Uh, it's, we're just jamming in as much as we can. And we're going to live, the cabaret space is sold out but we're going to live stream the show into the restaurant <laughs> bar area. Oh my God. And pump the your music in. So even if you're not in the room, you're in the room. And my friend, uh, Maranti is, she is an incredible performer and a chef. She's actually won like a food network cooking show and she's making a custom made cake for us. That's going to be redunculous. Everyone gets cake. <laughs> and then my friend DJ Crystal Clear is making a party mix for us. And we're just going to have a dance party after. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a party. It is it's a party it and it's for incredible. a good cause. There is no downside of being there. There is no downside of attending. There's no downside of if you go, you're going to get incredible music and know that the fi the funds are going to something that's going to help a lot of people. Yes. And reproductive rights are women's rights, are human rights. Um and as we know, they are under threat so we're gonna give a little back yeah and it's only 15 dollars to be in the bar restaurant area mm -hmm. and then and you can talk as much as you want and i won't call you out <laughs> <laughs> so there's a perk <laughs> And if you don't know if you're going to be there, but then end up being able to go, there are $20 cash tickets um, yes. on the day of. So feel free to show totally. up then. Yeah. There will be links to all the information in the description. We want you guys to go. We fully support this. We think this is a great, great oh, event with you. a great, great performer. Um, if you can make it out, please do. And if not, catch the live stream. Yay. Because I know I will. Yes. <laughs> all right all right uh, is there anything else you want to say before we before we wrap it on up no i think i'm good i think i talked a lot <laughs> well that's <laughs> that's incredible um anytime you want to come back and we can talk about any musical you want you have an open reservation we will always make room for you you were i would love account. it you just you heard about the eva van hova west side story right mm-hmm that's that's gonna be so good i'm excited i'm excited mm. for that i'm excited for so much theater is alive and well and it makes me so happy in all of its forms that's right well thank you for joining me raquel i really appreciate it of good course. luck and happy early birthday thank you darling all right <laughs> okay. you enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll you see you too. next time on musicals with cheese